Good morning, everybody out there in, Good morning. in the, in the Good church morning. and out there in internet land. We are doing 2 Corinthians, starting off in chapter 12, and we also do 13. So if you want to get your Bibles ready, get comfy, and we're going we're gonna to do some serious studying. Yes, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you want to get a Bible, there's ones readily available throughout the church. I'm going to start off with verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Please excuse me, I've got a, something in my throat. It's been there for months now. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up in the third heaven. Okay, let me break this down a little bit. Here, of course, his brother Paul, who's talking, stresses that as a matter of boasting, he has had no choice. By insisting that their teachers display their credentials, he's talking about the um, Corinthians. They want to know the credentials of the people they're teaching. The Corinthians were forcing him to break a 14-year silence and boast about a vision the Lord had given him. Huh. Tell us, what did you see? Tell us, we want to know. Oh, what did you see? What did God allow you to see? Uh -uh. Ain't happening. Verse 3. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Though Paul's reluctance to boast caused him to caused him to refer to himself in a third person. The context makes it obvious that he was speaking about himself. So Paul is talking about himself. So it's kind of interesting how the Bible puts it and how Paul puts it. He's talking about himself. So, I know such a man. Well, yeah, he's talking about himself, but he wouldn't say himself. So it's kind of cool that it's put that way. Now, verse 4. How he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Because the words were for him alone, Paul was forbidden to repeat them. And if he could have expressed them co coherently, he might not even be able to talk about it. This could be a whole other language. We don't have a clue. The encouragement to Paul in his ministry, otherwise he would have been urged to make them known to others. He, they, everybody wanted to know what he's heard. Please tell us what was said. We want to know. Nope, wasn't going to happen. All right. The constraint or pro prohibition was, it is not lawful for a man to utter. Helps explain why he had not told about this revelation earlier and told everybody. It was not lawful for him to tell them. <coughs> Sorry, people. <coughs> Verse 5 and 6. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. All right, let me break this down a little. Paul has said before that his boasting of self is generally considered foolish. And we could find that in several places in Corinthians. This caused Paul to be very slow and reluctant to speak about himself. He didn't want to talk about himself. What do you want to talk about? You want to talk about God. Everything he pointed back to God. That's how he was, and that's how a lot of us should be. It should not be all about me, 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 me. It should be about Jesus and who Jesus is. Verse. It's all about Jesus. Amen. It's all about Jesus, sister. It's all about him. Verse 7. At least I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. A thorn in the flesh I was given to me, 
a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. All right. This is confirmed by the fact that the thorn was given to achieve a beneficial purpose, the prevention of spiritual conceit or arrogance. This was sent to him by God to keep him humble. I don't know if you guys remember Job. Satan was the immediate cause, but God was the ultimate, God was the ultimate cause. Remember, Job had all kinds of things happen to him wasn't very pleasant satan did a lot of things but satan had to go to god and ask ask god to allow it to happen and god said yes i will allow it to happen do we know what the thorn was in paul's side no we don't we have no clue all right verses eight and nine Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul prayed three times for the thorn to be removed. But he was supplied continually with grace from God to endure it. As I said before, we don't know what this thorn was. It's an eternal mystery. We won't know until we get to heaven. Yo, Paul, brother, what's going on? Tell me, what was that thorn? What was it, brother? Well, I just kind of want to know, what was it? You know, that's probably going to be one of my questions when I get there. What was the thorn? What was it? Was it gout? Was he blind in an eye? You know, there's all kinds of theories that people have. Honestly, I don't care, but I kind of care. You know, hey, Paul, what was, what was it? What was that thorn in your side? I don't think it's going to be a physically a thorn from a bush in his side. It was something that happened that God allowed Satan to put in him. Yes, sir. Verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So no matter what great difficulties that come from serving Christ during these times, the power of Christ surround him and was revealed through him. So when we have challenges, when we are attacked, we need to lean on God and he will come through us and do things through us that we would not normally be able to do. When we are, are have reproaches, when we are persecuted, when we are under great stress, we can take comfort that God is with us. And it is great. It is a great comfort to rely on the one who created us. But we need to remember and have that in our forethought and mind when we're going through the dredges through the trenches of life, God is with me. That'll give you a different outlook on things. Yeah, you know, you're right. God is with me. Let me look to him for my power and my strength to go through this garbage I'm going through of everyday life. <clears throat> and not just everyday life. We are going to have challenges in our lives. We're going to have broke cars, broke vehicles. We're going to be sick. We're going to have calamities. Let me lean on you, Lord. Help me through this. And let me shine with your with your holiness, Lord. Let me be more like you. Just guide me, Lord. We need to step back. And I, I continually say this to everybody here. We need to step back and look at life in a different view and see Christ and how he's helped us and guided us. All right, verses 11 and 12. I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended by you. For in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Truly the signs of apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. <clears throat> all right, here, Paul is conscious that he has just said he was an, he was an exercise in foolishness. 
but the Corinthians themselves drove him to it. He says, I ought to have been commended by you, and if that had been done, then he would not have had to commend himself. People do not need to indulge in an unpleasant act of self-condemnation. Hey, look at me, look how great I am. When their friends or those <coughs> whom they have ministered take positive action to defend their integrity when it is called into question unfairly. People around them should be able to notice who this person is and what they're doing. Paul reminds his readers that he is not in the least inferior to the eminent or super apostles of that time in respects of the things that mark an apostle. For signs, wonders, and miracles had been performed by him among the Corinthians. They had seen what he had done. There was no reason for them to question who he was. <clears throat> and yet, there were, amongst, there, were one, there were ones amongst the crowd who were doing that. Verse, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 13. For what is it in which you were inferior to other churches, except that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. The only respect in which they could have been said to be inferior was, was Paul said ironically that I was never burdened you, meaning that he never accepted any kind of financial responsibility from the Corinthians. He never asked any money from them to support him or the ministry. The, this significance was the fact <coughs> had been twisted and used against the apostle as evidence that he did not love the Corinthian believers. Well, because he's not asking for money from them, he must not love them. That's just twisted. Because he did not ask for money from them, they thought he did not love them. That's what some of the people in the crowd were saying. That's just odd and bizarre. No, he was trying to save them for another point in time in the future where he was going to ask for money from them to help support the ministry. Verses 14 and 15. Now for the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours, but you, for the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. All right, let me break this down a little. This took me a little while to, to get. <coughs> this third visit to Corinth, Paul tells his readers that he will not be a burden to them because what he wants is not your possessions but he wants you think of, of his ministry as that of a parent to a small child he adds after all children should not have to save up for their parents but parents for their children for this reason he is willing not to only spend everything he has like financially he is willing to not only he is also, excuse me, also willing to expend himself to sacrifice his own life for them. Following such a declaration of his love and commitment to the Corinthians, he makes a statement that is abundant love for them. And he is going to mean that he will, and by this, it means that he will be loved less by them. Which is strange theology, but that's how they were. Because he loves them so much. They love him less because of it. Very weird people over there. Verses 16 through 18. But, be that as it may, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you by cunning. Did I take advantage of you by any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus and sent our brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? Although Paul had been a financial burden to them in the past, some thought that Paul had a devious plan to collect money for himself through his associates. The collection money would go to him, but this deception is flatly denied in verse 17. Because he said he didn't take it. The Corinthians could not find any, find any evidence for it. Paul sent Titus and the brother, 
to promote the collection, but they shared the same mindset and behaved the same manner as Paul. And the Corinthians knew it. The simple truth was that neither Paul nor the, his representatives had in any way defrauded the Corinthians. And once again, there were those in the crowd that were not happy with it. They were looking for some way to find fault with Paul and the fellow believers. <clears throat> Verses 19, verse 19. Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. If the Corinthians thought that Paul's main concern was the defense of his self-image, they were severely wrong. His concern was their edification and that they should grow in the knowledge of Christ, which Paul hoped to achieve through his defense. Paul sought to edify the Corinthians to build them up, not to pardon himself and think and make himself less. He was trying to build them up to help them gain more knowledge in who God was, to teach them who Jesus was. And that's all he was trying to do. Verses 20 and 21. <clears throat> For I fear least when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults, lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, lewdness, which they have practiced. <sighs> All right, and here Paul expressed his concern in his upcoming visit. The Corinthians, he wished to not find them living in sin. All that is talking about sin. When he visited them, Paul did not want to find the Corinthians the same sorry, pitiful way, the same pitiful spiritual condition as his last visit. That was a painful visit for him to find them that way. If he found them that they were not what he desired, still practicing the same sins that we just listed, they would find him not as they wished. He would have to dis discipline them. And that would not be a good thing. To find the Corinthians still living in unrepented sin would both humiliate and sadden Paul. All that teaching that he taught them was for vain. They wouldn't have listened to anything he said. He was hoping to not find them that way. This, this warning was designed to prevent that from happening. He told them this because he was really hoping when he came back again that they were a changed people and that he wouldn't see all this sinning going on as we listed. He was hoping to see a changed people. <clears throat> <clears throat> and that is kind of what we do as pastors and preachers and even everybody here. The more we read the Bible, we're hoping to see a change, not to repeat the same sins that we used to do. Oh, what's God say about this? Oh, this is what God says about that. Oh, okay. If God says that, and it's his word, it says I shouldn't do that, and God has a reason why. Well, I guess I shouldn't do that. I mean, if God says I shouldn't do it, that's a pretty good thing. And if God says, oh, yeah, I should do this, then I guess I should do that. God has a really good plan. God's been around since the beginning of the universe and God has a plan for me and things I should do and shouldn't do I think I should listen to God and here Paul is explaining to them in verses 20 and 21 these are things that you shouldn't do and when I come back I really hope you're not doing them I think he has a good plan and you should convey it to them alright that is the end of chapter 12 Cruise right through that. You guys survived. Now we're going on the 13th. Are you guys ready for this one? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Can I get a hand? Who, who's ready? 
Yay. Well, doesn't matter. I'm still going anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'm still going <clears> to... <throat> excuse me. Man, this thing won't leave me alone. Verse, chapter 13, verse 1. This will be the third time I am coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Yes. The principle of justice that no accused person be convicted upon the testimony of a single witness was established in the law of Moses. We can find that in Numbers and Deuteronomy. And Jesus had indicated the continuing validity of this principle in Matthew. It's very important. Paul's introduction of this Old Testament instruction without the usual it is written in the case that even at this early date it is universally accepted by the church. And that is really important. So you weren't guilty of something unless two or three people saw it. That's really important for the church back then. All right. Verse 2. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare, and it leaves a blank. I thought that was pretty cool. All right, here, Paul, I warned those who sinned before and all the others, and I warned them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, and that if I come again, I will not spare them. He is going to chastise them. He is going to talk to them, probably going to yell at them. Here, let me point this out to you. I told you before not to do this has to do with shame. Have you ever had somebody talk to you and you just oh, want to crawl in a corner because they talk to you and they explain to you where you were wrong and you're like, you're right? This is what he's going to do to them if they're still sinning. You ever been brought down by someone who just talks to you and, yep, you're right, I was wrong. This is what he's going to do to them when he comes back if he finds them still sinning. It's not a fun place to feel like you've been at. Not at all. But that's what he's going to do if they're still sinning. All right, verses 3 and 4. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him in the power of God toward you. All right, let me explain this a little bit. <clears throat> this will not be the, the proof they expect, visions and revelations, signs and wonders. In, <clears throat> instead, it will be the exercise of the power of Christ to discipline offenders. He reminds them that Christ was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. In a like fashion, he himself, though weak, will deal with them by God's power through him. So they better hold on, because it's not just Paul, but it's the power of God that's going to work through him to deal with the people. Powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. Verses 5 and 6. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Something we should all do. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Paul turned the tables on the accusers. Instead of presuming to evaluate his apostleship, they needed to test the genuineness of their faith. The Corinthians were to look at themselves to see if their conduct was the in unity with their faith. They need to see if they're in alignment with the faith. They need to see if they're following the word. Paul totally expected this test would reveal that Jesus Christ was in them. He was expecting them to find that they were in alignment with Jesus. <coughs> that they were genuine true believers. Although he entertained the possibility that the actions of some might indicate that they were not true followers of the Christ. Paul insisted <clears throat> that Christian profession must be evident 
by Christian conduct. When they passed the test, they would realize that Paul, their Christian father, passed the test as well. Their true conversion testified to the truth of Paul's words and deeds. So it all relied when his children, being Paul the father, passed the test. That means their father did a good job, meaning Paul did a good job. That means they were listening intently on what Paul, their father, did and said. He was a good example, and he taught them well. Not that he was going to be all puffed up, be like, wow, you know, Christ worked through me really well, and they listened. That's what he was hoping that he would achieve, that they listened and did well. Verses 7, 8, and 9. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do what is honorable, though we may seem disqualified. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. <clears throat> and this we also pray, that you are made complete. Paul's prayer for the Corinthians is that they will do nothing wrong. His concern is the Corinthians benefit, not his own reputation. Paul professed that he could not do anything against the truth, but only for the truth is best understood as meaning that he could never act in a way that is contrary to the gospel or its moral implications. He wanted to be in alignment with God's word and not go against God's word. <clears throat> Paul, in that case, would be glad in his weakness, that is, in his lack of op for opportunity to exercise his apostolic power, to be an apostle. Because that would mean that the Corinthians were spiritually strong, and that's what he was hoping for, that they were following the word. In fact, Paul's prayer was precisely for the restoration of the Corinthians to spiritual strength and completeness. He wanted them to be following. He did not want them to fall back in sin again. <clears throat> he did not want them to fall back into sin. He wanted them, <clears throat> sorry folks, to be following the Lord. That's what his ultimate goal was. That's what most of our pastors want us to be. We want the people to be following the Lord, not falling back into sin. Verse 10, Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness, according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. One complete sentence to the Corinthians of why Paul is writing this letter. Building them up, not tearing them down. But he will bring them to the woodshed if he needed it to. So he wants to build the people up. I mean, if he was there and present, you could probably really rip him a new one. Look, you did this wrong, this wrong. But he's writing a letter. He's trying to be kind. He wants to build them up. Let me tell you what you're doing right. Let's change some things. Focus more on the Lord instead of tearing them down. There's no, there's no good in tearing some, some people down. Build people up, showing where the strengths are, and then say, hey, you know, you can change here. Let's change this. Let's grow close to the Lord. And today, read more of the Bible. Do more Bible studies. You know, those are examples. Verse 11. <clears throat> Finally, brethren, farewell, become complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Paul's concluding encouragement for his readers is that they should aim for perfection. They'll never achieve it because nobody's perfect, only Jesus is. But he says, listen to my appeal, be of one mind. Live in peace and harmony. Do not fight amongst yourselves. Try to live in peace. That is a great thing. 
love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as God loves you. And that's one of the commandments somewhere. Ooh, that's a commandment somewhere. We should do that. All right, verses 12 and 13. Greet one another with a kiss. That's old school, really old school. All the saints greet you. A holy kiss. It's a greeting in biblical times, much like today's handshake. For Christians, it further expressed brotherly love and unity. I don't see anybody nowadays going around, hey, mm, how you doing? No, I'll give you a nice handshake. Nice to see you. But it is back then, and actually still it is over today in Greece. I know a couple of good friends who are Greek, and they still do that. And it's a, it's a really intimate friendship thing. It's more closer than what we do today with a handshake. All right, all the saints great. Where it says all the saints greet you. Excuse me. Wow, I spelled that wrong. Good for me. Those in Macedonia is where he's probably talking about. It could be possibly Philippi or Ephesus. Is from where Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. While encouraging unity within the Corinthian church, Paul did not want the Corinthians to lose sight of the unity with other churches. He wanted them, them to continue being friends with the other churches. So that's why he says, all the saints greet you. Verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God in the communion of the Holy Spirit would be with you all. Amen. This we call <clears throat> the Trinity. Reminded the Corinthians of the blessings they had received. Grace from the Lord Jesus Christ, love from God the Father, and the communion with God and one another through the Holy Spirit. They were, and we are all loved, through God in many the three forms, the Trinity. May the Spirit be with us all. May God be with us all. May we all have relationship with Jesus. There's still only one way to get to God, and that's through Jesus. I pray we all know who Jesus is. If you don't know who he is, contact us. Visit us. Talk to us. Talk to Pastor John around. It's really important you know who this Jesus is. He is... Uh, He's amazing. Very important. It's uh, what Christianity is built all around. He is alive. Still alive. He's been alive for a long time. Uh, kind of important. If you don't know who he is, contact us through internet. Talk to Pastor John and I. But God loves us all. Doesn't mean you're not going to have trials and tribulations. But that is the end of chapter 14, 13. Brother Paul went through it. He wrote many letters. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder what letter he would write to the churches today. Each church would be different, but some of the churches today, I bet, would uh, have a scathing letter. they would probably have less than an encouragement. They would probably be yelled at. It would be in bold type. <laughs> A bold type text they would receive from Brother Paul. And they, uh, he'd probably say, you need to get in line with what God's Word says. It shouldn't be tickling people's ears. You need to preach the Word. I'm sure that would come out of Brother Paul's letter. Uh, if people would start thinking like that, it would not be the same as it is right now. Anyways, that is the end of today's uh, teaching. Thank you for joining in. Have a great day and uh, the birth of Jesus right around the corner. Have a great day and God bless. <clears throat>